his Soteriology 101 account. Um, if a girl says to a Calvinist, no one can come to my party unless my dad invites him and I will give them a piece of cake. Does the Calvinist conclude everyone invited to the party will necessarily come? I'm asking for a friend. So as I said, my response was to quote John 644 from Greek and say, given the sentence structure, surely you are attempting to parallel John 644. Yes? I didn't get a response initially. Then someone else posted something else that Soteriology 101 said that pretty much answered the question, which was this comment. Some of you, this is Leighton, some of you are expressing disagreement of the word invites. But what if I said calls instead? Don't get caught up with the term, but consider the potential meaning of the term. Given that Jesus himself says enable in verse 65 demonstrates that draws doesn't necessarily connote effectuality. There's the argument. There's the key. There's the key. Verse 65 can only be John 6, 65, so therefore this is John 6, 44. Then eventually, Leighton did get around and said, well, or at least that I found, um, this one might be more clear if you wish to engage Dr. White, but why not do it in person on the program together? Because we already did that and we saw what you did. Here's his, now here's his, uh, how does he put it, more clear example? Then why didn't you do this at the start? No man can come to my wedding banquet unless the king calls, slash, invites, slash, draws, slash, enables him, all caps, the hymns in all caps, and I will raise him, all caps, up on the last day. Now, For a number of years now, we have been pointing out, and many people have seen it. I saw a great tweet, um, I think this morning or last night, I think this morning from a, a fellow who said, uh, you know, I was really into the Soteriology 101 stuff, but it left me absolutely defenseless to all of the Roman Catholic, Catholic Eastern Orthodox, all that stuff. You know, the, the lack of exegesis, the allegorical stuff, this left me defenseless. I'm very thankful that I found Reformed theology and, and, and found a, a way of defending against that. So I'm, I'm appreciative of that. But either example, I, I want to walk through them, and I want to illustrate what the primary problem is with provisionism as it is being defined and regularly promoted by Leighton Flowers. I don't see anybody else doing it in a leadership position. Um, Leighton, I think, did like three hours in response to the last dividing line where I went through some of his stuff. He just cranks this stuff out. It is his job. He's Well, this is evangelism for Texas Baptists. <laughs> evangelism for Texas Baptists is watching the dividing line and responding to the dividing line. That's, that's how you evangelize in Texas. Um, actually, it's immunization against Calvinism is what, what his primary job is. But what you have here is, we have said, he uses analogies. It's like this. It's like that. Exegesis isn't his thing. That Drawing your beliefs directly from the living text in its context is the power of sound theology. Walking through a text, walking through Romans 8, 28 through Romans 9, 25, without having to jump out here and jump out there and jump over here and jump on... Following the argument through is the is the great power. It, it has nothing to do with me. It doesn't have to do with anybody else. It is what the 
soul of the redeemed believer longs for. And that's why you just keep doing it. And then you just trust it. And when you see people going away, you see, I had this one guy say to me, uh, well, you know, I just listened to Leighton Flowers and found out you don't know what you're talking about. And I, and I said, ah, you must be choice meats, <laughs> you know? And he's like, well, that was a really childish thing to say. And I felt like saying, yes, choice meats was a very childish thing to say. I, I, I would agree with that, but just, you know, whatever, fine. You, you don't, it doesn't bother you. You just simply keep doing what you're doing because you know you can walk through Ephesians 1, 3 through 14, verse by verse by verse by verse consistently. You can do all of the sixth chapter of John, verse by verse by verse consistently. You don't have to jump here, jump there, jump there. Boop, 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 boop. Oh, over here, let's bring this in. Oh, let's bring it. In. That is how you can tell. Because people are always saying, yeah, but you know, you know Greek and he knows Greek and you know Hebrew and he knows Hebrew and, and this guy over here knows uh, this and, and how's anybody like me ever supposed to know? Well, it might take you longer, but you know by the consistency, the consistency over time. Who can walk through Ephesians 1 without having to run out of it every third word to come up with an analogy to redefine the meaning? Who can just simply... This is what Paul writes to the church at Ephesus. This is what they would have understood. This is what the words mean. This is what the grammar says. Who can do that? And who can do that in John 6? So here's the point. John 6, 44 does not stand on its own. Every time we've gone through John chapter 6, what have we demonstrated? That there is a consistent thread of meaning and usage that this analogy breaks and ignores. Because the consistent understanding and interpretation goes back to the fact that Jesus is talking to Jews who are, th this whole conversation is prompted by the fact that they have seen his miracles. He has left. They've now followed him. They've rowed boats across a lake to find him. They are seeking Jesus. And Jesus says, you don't believe. He's explaining their unbelief. And in explaining their unbelief, he introduces certain categories. So the ones that the Father gives him, they're the ones he raises up on the last day. Now, that's a part of what we have in John chapter 6. I will raise him up at the last day. Where is the parallel to getting a piece of birthday cake? to the real John 6.44, which is within a few sentences of John 6.37 and John 6.39. There is none because he can't deal with John 6 in this way. And he knows it. He knows it. He knows he has to run off here and there. He can't walk straight through. The words don't mean the things he tells you they mean. So as soon as I saw this analogy, I'm like, okay, no one can come to me. What has been defined as coming to Jesus before this? The Jews are grumbling. They're grumbling about Jesus' claims about himself. We, this, is, this is just the carpenter's son. This is, what, what is he claiming for himself? What, 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 what is all this about? He's, he's actually said that all the Father gives me will come to me. Where is the parallel to that in this analogy? Because the ones coming to him are given by the Father. So, how do, you, how do you parallel that with whoever the Father invites to a birthday party? That's not coming in faith. There's no issues of sin here. No, nothing. It is so absurdly ridiculous that... Most people, it's so absurdly ridiculous that most people just look at it and they can sense the absurdity, but they're not sure how, how exactly to identify what the absurdity is. But it is taking John 6, 44 and isolating it from John 6, 36 and what comes before and after it. That's, 
Now, he knows he can't do that. That's why he goes to John 6, 65 and wants to try to come up with a way of making the drawing ineffectual. This is, this is the sad and horrific thing about provisionism, is you, you have to understand their doctrine of the atonement, their doctrine of a calling has to be ineffectual. There has to be room for Christ to fail to save those he wants to save. There has to be room for Christ to fail to save those the Father has given to him. There has to be room for the Father to fail in drawing people unto Jesus. Because autonomy, man's will must be autonomous. That's what it's, that's what it's designed to uh, defend, and so man's will must be autonomous. So, all these things, even though you have the specific statement of Jesus, I've come down out of heaven, not do my own will, but the will of who sent me, this is the will of who sent me, that of all he's given me, I lose none, but raise them up on the last day. I lose none of them. Absolute, effectual work on the part of Jesus. By the time you get to verse 44, we've got to find a way to... No, no, that's... It. He tries. He tries, but man's will. Man's almighty will. So, being raised up the last day is not parallel to a piece of birthday cake. Being raised up the last day has already been defined previously as the work of the Son in saving those given by the Father, and that is receiving eternal life. The drawing of the Father, then, the key issue here, even in the language that is used, is does the Calvinist conclude everyone invited to the party will necessarily come? So what he's doing there is he is inserting a distinction between coming to the party and the assertion, no one can come to my party unless my dad invites them. Hmm. So... No one can come to the party unless my dad invites them. So what he wants to do is he wants to make the verb that is found in John chapter 6. Now, there, by the way, there has been some discussion about that just recently. Halkuse, some Calvinists, I think, go overboard because the, the verb is used when Peter draws the net up on the shore. That's the same verb. And so that is an extension of power and it is effective and efficient. Peter did not stand on the edge of the water and go, here, fishy, 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 come on, fishy, fishy, come on, flop on up here. That's not what he was doing. He was not wooing. And he did not invite the fish onto the shore. That's true. No question about it. But you don't have to say that the best translation is drag. Because the assertion is no one is able. See, that's what's missing here. There is an inability in man that has been removed from the analogy. Because the reason you can't come to the party is because daddy says you can't. That's not what John 644 is saying. John 6, 24 says, you lack the ability to come to me. There is something wrong with you. That's why the drawing has to be effective. What if the analogy was that the father sends an invitation to a quadriplegic, but then doesn't provide any way for him to get there? Oops. Not a very effective invitation, is it? The whole idea is you can't have Helkuse draw be an efficient, powerful, effective, God-ordained action. It simply has to be a provision. Because that's what provisionism is. Provisionism replaces the power of God with, a, with possibilities fulfilled by the power of man. Catch that? Provisionism replaces the power of God with provisions that are fulfilled by the power of man. I've said from day one, this is God-centeredness versus man-centeredness. And every time 
that they try to get around it. They only prove the point. They only prove the point. Now, what is interesting is that other quote about John 6.65. Don't get caught up with the term, but consider the potential meaning of the term. Potential. Got it? We don't... One thing is absolutely certain. When he tries to get... Like when he was dealing with Genesis 50, when he did the debate on, on, on Unbelievable, what did you hear? Well, it could be this. It could be that. This is not... It's, it's like when you're dealing with Molinism. Well, it could be this, it could be that. It's potential here, potential there. Not derived from the text. Leaves you with anything. So, um, given that Jesus himself says enable in verse 65, demonstrates that draws doesn't necessarily con connote effectuality. Let's see. Let's see if that's the case. John 6, 65. 664 says, but there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. Oh, it sounds like there's some sovereignty of God here. It sounds like there's some sovereign decree. Then verse 65, and he was saying, now, have you noticed that's in the imperfect? And the imperfect means that he was repeating this. He was saying this over and over again. Dia tuta, for this reason, I reka who mean, I said to you. So he's pointing them back to verse 44. Udais dunatai elthine pros me. No one is able to come to me. Now, can we just be honest here? Provisionism does not believe this. The whole essence of provisionism is everybody has the ability. Everybody has the capacity. All they need to hear is the invitation. But they all have the ability, and these people had heard it. That's not what Jesus is referring to. He says, no one has the ability to come to me. Ion me e dedamenon auto ectu patras. Unless... It has been given to him by the Father. Now, if he wants to say, well, that, that means enabled. What is that supposed to mean? Is that prevenient grace? You don't believe in prevenient grace. You're, the whole basis of your assertion is that we have the capacity, the free will, the autonomy outside of the extension of any grace to respond to a gracious message calling for repentance. So why does it have to be given? Even if you translate enable, why do you have to be enabled? Are you saying that it's the gospel message that enables, that there's something, it, are you trying to, to turn unless it has been given to him from the Father? Well, who has it been given from the Father, according to John 6? According to John 6, 37, all the Father gives me will come to me. You have the Father giving those who come to him. You've got it upside down and backwards. You've got it upside down and backwards. You can't escape this. So, the Eon in 665 is the Father granting something, giving something that is then described back in 644 as the drawing, and then the mechanism is described for us. That's what people miss. That's why I've tried to emphasize this. Don't deal with John 644 without dealing with John 645. It is written in the prophets, they shall all deductoi that you be taught by God. This is how the drawing takes place. They shall all be taught by God. Pas ha akusas para tu patras kai mathon erkatai pras eme. Everyone hearing from the Father and learning comes unto me. This is an effective divine act. 
to change this into, well, this is just a gospel proclamation and it's all up to us, turns the text upside down. It voids it of meaning. It makes it say the exact opposite of what it is saying. Think about it. They shall all be taught of God. Jesus is saying this text is being fulfilled in what God the Father is doing in drawing his people unto me. They shall all be taught of God. That's being drawn to the Son, the revelation of the Son, the one hearing from the Father. Do all hear from the Father? If you're turning this into simple gospel proclamation, if you ignore the fact that in the golden chain of redemption, there is a calling that is effective. All who are called are justified. You're saying all are called. And if you do not have an effective calling, does not make a lick of sense. But this is perfectly consistent in Reformed theology because here is the effective call. Learning. Hearing from the Father. This is exactly what is being described in the effective call in Romans chapter 8. Same thing. That's why 645 is where it is. You want to know what it means to be drawn to the Son? Why is it that all who are drawn by the Father? And that's the key. That's the key. Once again, I had a nice conversation, and I appreciated this. I've had a couple conversations, I, and I do try to mention this one, so I had a couple conversations on Twitter recently that actually went well. That there was actually hearing ears. And that's neat. That's nice. But a fellow said he had called into the program, didn't understand my response, so we started doing some stuff back and forth. I wrote a fair amount on Twitter yesterday. He even posted a sentence diagramming of John 644, which I appreciated. It wasn't accurate, but I appreciated the effort that he put into it. And because he did it, I was able to point. You notice you have these two broken. You know why they're broken? Because you're it's at it's broken at the point where you're struggling with what John 644 says. And what it was was the hymn. No one is able to come to me unless the Father who sent me Helkuse Auton, Auton, the accusative singular, him, direct object of the verb. It draws him. Kaga Anastaso, future, I will raise Auton, him up in the last day. There is no distinction between these two. You destroy the sentence structure. Auton is functioning appositively. That is, it is renaming the same him. The him that is drawn is the him that is raised up on the last day, which is eternal life. That means those that are drawn are raised up on the last day. These are divine, effective actions. Provisionism denies this and destroys it. Destroys it. That's why they have to fight this. They can't. They can't. It's not possible. Now, Leighton, you keep talking about, let's do a program together. Look, I'm tired of your analogies and I'm tired of your allegories, but I will do this with you. We'll do a debate. Only thing you can use is the Greek text. Only thing you can use is the Greek text. How about it? Well, that's not fair. No, it is fair. John 6, nothing but the Greek text. Because you cannot walk through this. And I'm not talking about your abilities or inabilities in Greek. You do say Dr. Layton Flowers, right? You are the head of evangelism for te Texas Baptist, right? Let me tell you something. When I taught for a Southern Baptist seminary, if I taught you through second year Greek, you could do this. You could do this. My second year Greek students could do it. Why can't you? And you know why you won't do this? Because you can't, and you know you can't. When you are so completely dependent on analogesis, allegorogesis, well, it's sort of like birthday cake and a dad at a birthday party. No, it's not. No, it's not. And we'll, we'll do half an hour because you complained that our debate, well, I, I couldn't, I can't exegete Romans 9 in 20 minutes like you did. We'll do half an hour. We'll do half an hour and you give and we will start. All this will be you want to do this right? All this will be is John chapter 6 alone. That's all you can do. You can't bring anything else in. 
I can make sense of John chapter 6 from verse 1 to the very end. Walk straight through it. You cannot. Your beliefs will not allow you to do it. You have traditions, Leighton, that destroy your ability to walk through the text and allow it to speak for itself. That is a fact. And this analogy, this allegory, demonstrated. Demonstrated.